But first, it's been 36 years since Washington State adopted a new criminal sentencing structure. Now there are recommendations for a wholesale overhaul of sentencing. This comes as Democrats and Republicans both are increasingly focused on criminal justice reform and the issue of reentry. Police reforms, training and recruitment are also a hot topic these days. But what changes are in the works this year and what might the future hold? Joining me now to talk about these issues in the 2020 session and going into the future are House Public Safety Chair Roger Goodman, a Democrat, and House Republican Floor Leader Jacqueline Maycumber, who is a former law enforcement officer. Welcome both of you to Inside Olympia. Good to see you. Good to be here. Let's just start to sort of set the, the scene to talk a little bit about your backgrounds and what brought you specifically to public safety, criminal justice reform as topics of interest, concern, and passion of yours. Representative Goodman, you at one time were the executive director of the state sentencing guidelines commission. Yeah, when I first moved out here, my first job was uh, heading the sentencing guidelines commission. So I got to know all of the players in the criminal justice world. And gosh, it's been almost 25 years now. Uh, so I'm sort of stuck there. Uh, but it's really a fascinating topic. Uh, I, I think of uh, criminal justice not as some marginal topic or uh, a matter for sensational headlines or hit TV shows, but really uh, our, criminal, our system of criminal accountability is really a reflection of who we want to be as a society, so that I sort of take a philosophical view of it. Uh, and actually, when I look in the mirror, I don't I like what I see. I want to transform our criminal system to be a little bit less vengeful and retri retributive and more uh, rehabilitative, uh, restorative, and compassionate. Okay. And I certainly get the sense that that shift is happening, not just in Washington, but, but nationally. Yeah. So Representative Maycomber, what brings you to this particular topic and, yeah. and background? Yes, well, for, as a former law enforcement officer, it's, it's a special place to be able to put on a uniform and a badge and uh, put your life on the line for someone else. And usually those moments are the moments in their life where it's the most dangerous, the most traumatic, the, the saddest, and you're willing to risk your life to protect them. And so to have that ingrained in you and that wanting to protect and love your community is so important. So as a former officer and my family, former law enforcement officers, there's a special love of your community. And then as a mother, we're trying to protect our families and our communities and really look at the big picture because uh, public safety isn't just public safety. It is our families, our communities, our safety, our, our, our enjoyment of walking around. And it's a broad range of issues, including mental health. So there's a lot of issues rolled into one. Okay. You were a deputy sheriff, is that right? Yes, and I you, was. And you also are representing a very rural and, uh, corner of the state yes. uh, in, this, uh, in Northeast Washington. How does that um, inform sort of how you're thinking about, and we'll get into some of the specifics in a minute of your bills, but just this urban versus rural and how the needs can be so different, especially when it comes to public safety. Well, you have to be, in a rural area, you have to know that you're not going to get your seven minute response time. I mean, and a lot of officers too are going to DV calls and you're waiting while you're listening for backup. You could be waiting for an extensive period of time. We are, Washington State right now is ranked the lowest in the nation for law enforcement officers per capita. I mean, that is staggering and quite frankly upsetting when you have West Virginia above you. And for us to reach the numbers to even get closer to the 49th state, I mean, we will have to recruit and put out higher than we've ever done, almost double our yearly recruitment. And so what's happening now is we're reaching what we call the silver wave or the retirement bell curve. And when that hits, what's gonna happen to our communities when those traumatic situations occur? And whether that is safety or even medical, who is gonna respond, who's going to get there and those traumatic moments where your life is on the line. Yeah, and so you're talking about sort of that demographic shift that's about to happen with a wave of retirements out of many professions, including law enforcement. I know the State Patrol has been talking about this and preparing for it. But that is also, you know, sort of another pressure point right now is that we've got a, a prison system at maximum capacity and we're a state that has not built a new prison in many, many years. And I think for the most part, there's lawmakers no, don't want to do it. No, um, no. So as you're thinking about sort of shifting back now to um, sentencing and sentencing reform, where are we kind of on that continuum? And on, I mean, as I noted, it's been more than three decades since we last did it. Yeah. Help us understand as we sit in 2020, where, what the thinking is and where people are headed. The thinking has changed. Uh, it used to be, uh, you know, rehabilitation doesn't work. People won't ch can't change and we need to just lock them up. 
and that was 35 years ago. Uh, the research since has really shown that, particularly with regard to behavioral health, uh, people can change uh, their, their way of living uh, and can be rehabilitated. Uh, and also, we've sort of uh, continued to ratchet up uh, prison sentences. Uh, the legislature tends to get tough because it's politically popular. But uh, we've all, I think in a bipartisan way, realized that we've gone too far. And so we need to use um, incarceration resources much more judiciously now and then um, focus much more on community-based responses. We need to incapacitate those who are a threat to the community, no doubt about it, uh, and we will continue to do that. But uh, this community-based response links right into the fact that we don't have uh, enough law enforcement officers to assist with that. Uh, and uh, police community relations are just beginning to improve, and we work together uh, in the last couple of years to uh, resolve the issue of uh, use of deadly force and that has brought the community uh, together with the police that serve them, uh, I think unlike un any other place in the nation. So that's a first step um, to, to realize that public safety is uh, hard work and we sort of take it for granted that our kids are safe in school and people are safe in public places and people are safe in their homes and on the roadways. Uh, and so both the issue of more uh, recruitment and better training for law enforcement as well as uh, uh, holding people accountable uh, much more in the community instead of behind bars uh, works together. So we have a long way to go, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Well, and to that end of sort of building on what's been started here with the police deadly force, the change in the law, there was the initiative and then the agreement that was um, grew out of uh, um, meetings between law enforcement and community members. If that is the foundation for starting to rebuild trust, and I say if because I know that there are deep-seated mistrusts, especially in marginalized communities, but one of your proposals, one of the bills you've introduced is, and you've got a package of bills around law enforcement, but has to do with creating some sort of outreach program specifically built, designed to build on this trust and to work especially in rebuilding trust with diverse communities. What's your vision? What are you imagining? How would this work? Oh, I, I, Children in, in certain communities need to reflect back and see, um, you know, officers that look like them and sometimes, you know, it can speak in their language because we want that second generation coming up. And so having that outreach and having officers go into those communities and like we mentioned before, being 50th in the nation, you're not doing community policing, you're doing reactive policing. That means you're taking call after call in emergency situation instead of just being a part of the community, walking around, meeting the kids, meeting the families, and so those kids can see the future. Instead, you're responsive, which means when there's a bad situation, you're there. And so that's what's being seen. So to have our second generation or next generation come up and want to be a part of law enforcement, they need to see the, the community side. They need to see the reflection of them in the uniform. And that's so important when, you know, these communities are, are kids are growing up. You want to see not just the reactionary law enforcement, but the proactive community policing side. So I, I think it's positive that we go into the communities, that the children see that there is um, a side of them that they're going to be there to protect their families and communities in the future. So not just recruiting the next generation, but making sure that that next generation of law enforcement officers reflect the communities they're policing are, is a diverse group, class. Well, we're, we're working at, I mean, there's such a broad range of communities that we have, and that's what makes Washington great. So having those communities understand that they are the next generation. Right. They are, you know, part of what wa makes Washington good and amazing, and so we need to start making sure we're all part of that community. Yeah. Certainly not easy to do. I've noticed another aspect yeah. about the young recruits coming up. I go to the Criminal Justice Training Center and yeah. see the Basic Law Enforcement Academy, and I sit there at the cafeteria and talk with them. Uh, the older uh, uh, law enforcement officers have a kind of an old-fashioned view of, uh, of uh, crime and justice, uh, and the newer sort of millennials, I guess, uh, have a different conception of justice, uh, not chasing after the bad guys, uh, but really as defenders of democracy and uh, more as guardians rather than warriors, right? And so it's very encouraging to see the new recruits and their attitudes, uh, and it's not police versus the community, but police are part of the community and they serve the community in which they live. So I'm, I'm really impressed with the new attitudes. What is the, so it's a short 60-day session, and I know that you've been thinking about for the next long session, 2021, teeing up a lot of the recommendations that have come out of the sentencing uh, guidelines task force. 
Um, but let's talk about this year and the, some of the changes that you, that you think might get done in a short session around sentencing and, and community supervision. So it seems like one of the priorities for this session is changing the way we do for somebody who's coming out of prison and then they're gonna be supervised by a community corrections officer. One of the key changes is that the way we're supervising now is we're doing this in consecu consecutively instead of concurrently. Explain that. Yeah, we in general sort of need to rationalize how we are supervising people in the community. If we're not going to be locking people up as long uh, because they're not a threat to the community and we want to ease them back into the community better, uh, we need to change the way we supervise and we also need to have more people employed as community corrections officers, so that's part of this. Um, there's a number of different proposals moving through the legislature right now. One is that if you are behaving well, you're, you're going to all your meetings and pro uh, complying with all the conditions, uh, that will give you time off. Uh, and, the, and research shows this is a very strong incentive to, uh, it reduces recidivism and uh, we don't, we don't want to over-supervise those uh, and waste our resources. So that's but this is like you're already, that we already have, if you're in prison, you can get earn That's credits. different. That's more of an administrative tool. You don't really earn time off your, your incarceration period. Uh, you actually kind of can lose your time that's sort of automatically calculated in. This is really an incentive-based way to earn time off your supervision period in the community. Shorten that time yeah. when you're, you're going to be checking in with a community corrections officer. Yeah, there's all officer. sorts of things you need to do, go to meetings and right. drug testing yeah. and so forth. And if they do everything they're supposed to do, then we'll you know, let them go back into the community without watching them so much because they don't need it. And then we can focus uh, scarce resources on those who do need it. That's the first thing. The second is what you mentioned, this concurrent versus consecutive terms of supervision. Uh, we want to be able to apply these conditions and prohibitions on those who are in the community at the same time. If you're because the idea is if I was in prison, convicted of three crimes, I come out, I'm going to be in community supervision for those. Yeah. I would do one stretch of community supervision for crime number one, a second stretch for crime number two, and a third stretch for crime number three. Yeah, and for crime number two and crime number three, we'd have to wait for that supervision period to kick in after the first one to apply the conditions related to that crime. And Which it doesn't make any sense. Drug treatment. Drug treatment or whatever, or domestic violence yeah. treatment. Yeah. And so we want to layer it so that all of the conditions are imposed at the same time. Uh, it's also much more efficient uh, as well. These are bipartisan proposals, but there is opposition, especially from the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs, who feel like um, two things, that some of these bills are undermining our swift and certain um, approach to, to people who are not complying with community supervision. A few years ago, it was all about just get them into jail really quickly, mm -hmm. immediately after the, the um, violation. And then also that, that stepping away from shortening community supervision, they say, is going backwards. Um, how do you respond to the criticism you're hearing, especially from WASPEC? So the sheriffs and police chiefs, I think their principal concern is that if we are going to be shortening uh, supervision periods or making them more efficient or more rational, uh, we are going to be saving a lot of money uh, doing this, and yet they're concerned that that money is just going to disappear and go into the general fund. And I am determined that the, f the resources we save by rationalizing our community supervision system will be reinvested. We call it justice reinvestment. This is a national trend. Uh, take money that's not well spent in the justice system and reinvest it where it should be. And that should be for preparing prisoners before they've been released uh, to successfully reintegrate into the community. We call it reentry. Uh, and so I'm committed to that. And, and I'm working with the sheriffs and police chiefs to and, do that. And I know you are right that they are concerned about the fact that they think this is just a cost-cutting measure. But they also say, for instance, with this consecutive versus concurrent, or concurrent versus consecutive, it does not make sense to effectively reduce time on supervision. The bill will dramatically reduce supervision time for many, therefore negatively impacting public safety. So there are, are going to be opportunities to lengthen supervision periods for those who aren't behaving well and who are at a high risk to reoffend. And so that's part of all this proposal is to supervise for longer periods and more intensively those who really might not do well back in the community but not waste our resources for those who are doing well and are not a high risk to reoffend. So that's why I say why we're sort of rationalizing community supervision. So you talked about the need to potentially recruit more community uh, corrections officers yes. going forward. You are very interested in thinking about the pipeline for law enforcement officers generally. So we've got the state 
uh, Criminal Justice Training Center in Berrien. Mm -hmm. We've got the State Patrol Academy that trains troopers. It's, you're thinking about, it sounds like two things. One is, can you get more classes through the CJTC? And also, might there be an opportunity to train future law enforcement officers on the east side of the state? Could there be a corollary training center? Yeah, you know, in Eastern Washington, it's harder when you leave your family and you, you go stay in a hotel in Burien and you're not close to your home, you're not close to your family, they're doing 19 weeks of training, and then you're not close to your department. So having the training in Eastern Washington, you can go home on the weekends and you can also do a training which is you can get in the car because it's a little shock to the system to get on the streets and, and have that experience for the first time. So, um, you know, retention rates really increase when you're in a vehicle with an FTO and you can see what your future will be in and learn it's not just books, but also training as you go along. So it's really important to get close to those uh, departments. And in addition, a lot of the tribes, um, you know, filling those slots in Burien are a little more difficult um, to get those slots because it takes longer for you to, you know, uh, do a lot of that uh, recruitment and a lot of the testing that you have to go through through psych profiles, uh, and it's a lot of background checks to make sure you're the right fit. So getting that slot's really important. So we wanna make sure those slots are open for the Eastern Washington and having that ability to, to bring those recruits and, and really make sure they go through the POP process and stay and have their local departments be able to work with them. So what is the, where do things stand in terms of this idea? I mean, it is a short session, it's a supplemental budget year, but what kind of traction, and you're in the minority, <laughs> but what, what kind of traction are these ideas getting? Uh, well, the good chair and I worked very well together on one of these policies. I would say that was probably the best um, hearing I've ever had on a bill. Oh, well, in, which, in which one was that? Uh, 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 the uh, CJTC uh, Academy. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, increasing, we, she's increasing been the leader. Uh, we really have to acknowledge Representative Maycumber in um, pushing to expand uh, the number of slots and the number of classes. We have really fallen behind. And, and this has been a focus the state patrol has been trying to do this, and the legislature has been trying to fund more state patrol classes, yeah. but CJCC, I, mean, I guess, There's too not many so much. recruits waiting in line for yeah. long periods of time to get the training they need so they can get out on the street. And she's really been a leader in this, and we are going to continue to, to sort of expand uh, the training so what's necessary. So realistically, and maybe I should ask you if you're the chair and you guys are <laughs> controlling so the, the purse strings here, in a supplemental budget, do you think that there will be money? Uh, oh, we're going to, whether we put it in law or not, we are going to be funding uh, the number of classes that are now necessary to keep the new recruits uh, through the pipeline and, and get them trained. The issue of where they are trained, however, yes. is contentious. So that's, okay, so that's, uh, that's and so contentious. We are, yes, we are one of the few states, uh, very few states, that trains all law enforcement officers from the state in the same location. Uh, and that really results in a consistent, high quality training protocol. So uh, there is some resistance to moving some of that training somewhere else in the state. Uh, rather, uh, we'd like to have more advanced training, those who are already out of the academy and on the street, and have the advanced training be... Uh, or regionally dispersed right, or something. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. What do you... What's how do you respond to that? Well, I was in negotiations last night for <laughs> this issue. Okay. Um, and I, uh, we did reach a positive conclusion. We're looking at the options. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy and I'm looking forward to what will come out this yeah. session. Okay. I think that we all, and, and this issue particularly, um, have the best thoughts in mind. We know we need more officers on the street. That is not a question. We know you can't wait six months, you know, after being accepted in to get to your job, you know, just to start it. You just can't do that. And you have high quality recruits that you went through the process they need to get start working immediately and get into the classes so I believe we are going to see a positive outcome in this short session because right now we're at crisis levels I mean really Washington State has reached a crisis and, and then to hit that bell curve of retirement um, uh, yesterday I was informed that uh, five uh, officers in Spokane County um, since January 1st have just left and so now there's another uh, 20 just in the last few months just in one department uh, to move that along and, and see what's going to happen in our communities when we call and we need a response we're really going to be in trouble. What is the um Going forward, um, I, do, I want to ask you about some of the other issues that are sort of in front of the legislature for this session, but just give us a sneak peek preview of 2021 when it comes to mm -hmm. sentencing reform. As I understand it, the big picture proposal would be we, we sort of went to determinate sentencing in the 80s, mm -hmm. truth in sentencing, and now there's and maybe, you know, there's the suggestion that prosecutors can have a lot of power these days. Maybe it's time to shift more of that back to judges and give them more latitude. Yeah. But as soon as you do that, you introduce concerns about 
getting away from truth in sentencing as well as are you introducing disparities back into the system? But just give us a top line 2021 preview on sentencing. So the sentencing task force uh, that I chair uh, will be working over the course of 2020 to prepare a huge package of legislative reforms to our sentencing system in 2021. Uh, we have determinate sentencing today. In other words, a judge will issue a sentence of a determined period. Yeah. That's not going to change. The question is how long is it going to be for each uh, person who's convicted? And we will want to tailor, to, to give the judge more discretion on a case-by-case -case basis to tailor uh, the punishment, whether it's incarceration or community supervision, combination of both, uh, to the particular individual and the particular circumstances of the case. Yes, if we increase this discretion, we will increase disparities case by case. Uh, and yet, and so that's the struggle. We're going to want to constrain that so that uh, similarly situated offenders will get commensurate treatment. Uh, but right now it's too uh, uh, fixed, it's, it's much too restricted, and so we are going to debate for a whole year now how much discretion are we going to want to give judges. Uh, bringing in the latest research uh, on what works to improve public safety and also to achieve this sense of justice uh, that we want through our system. Well, let's hit a couple other topics in the few minutes we have left. Death penalty repeal mm -hmm. has passed the state Senate now, I think, three times in recent years. The state Supreme Court has ruled that our current death penalty statute is unconstitutional. Key question, I think, is now that this bill has come over from the Senate again, it's now come to your committee this yes. year. A, will it get a hearing, but more importantly, what are its chances of passing the House this year? So I do, I am actually passionate about uh, the need to repeal the death penalty. There's all, all sorts of disagreements on this. These are uh, votes of conscience, uh, really. It's not so much a, a We've seen Republicans matter. voting for repeal. We've seen Democrats voting against yes, repeal in the Senate. This is one where the caucuses sort of let their members That's right. vote their conscience. Uh, it's I not do intend to votes. hear the bill uh, and move it out of my committee. Uh, and uh, it will then be sitting in, uh, you know, in front of our caucuses, and we will have a vigorous debate about whether to bring it to the floor and vote on it. I really strongly encourage my colleagues in the legislature to do this. The governor has a moratorium on the uh, death penalty. The Supreme Court has declared the uh, death penalty unconstitutional as applied to the facts of the case they heard, so it's not like they wiped it out completely. The legislature uh, has vested in it the sole authority to prescribe punishments for crimes. So it is our opportunity, it's our, our obligation to have the last word on this and not to leave it uh, uncertain. Uh, a future legislature could come back and revive the death penalty. Uh, and so we really need to sort of close the door on it, in my opinion. Why is 20, why, in the House, you've got a new Speaker of the House, but is there something that makes you think that this is more likely to make it to the floor this year than? in past years? It could be with the new speaker. Uh, I just think we, we've never really had that vigorous debate in our own sort of uh, inner sanctum in the caucus room. We've never talked about it uh, the way we will. I've spoken with the speaker about this and this issue will come before our membership for the discussion it deserves. What is your view on this? Well, this is such a big topic. Uh, the The Supreme Court didn't rule that uh, it, it's the death penalty. They ruled the application of the death penalty. So this is something we have to discuss. These are the most heinous, horrible crimes, rape, murder, dismemberment to our children. These are our most vulnerable people. And the only time this is actually used is in those emergency moments. And some of those, when we talk about even Gary Ridgway, we have Representative Jenny Graham, mm -hmm. who went through this process to find her 15-year-old sister. This is when it's used. It's used as leverage to say, you know, let's find this um, victims. Where are they? And you're allowing prosecutors a tool in the toolbox. And these are the most heinous crimes out there. And when you talk about sentencing and long term, you can't talk about removing the death penalty and then also removing life without parole. Because then you're having the most heinous criminals on our streets looking at 15 years maximum. And that is a shock to the system because the role of your, de your, uh, your criminal justice and the role of detainment is to protect your community. And when someone can do the most heinous things on earth to our children and our families and only be looking at 15 years, we're not protecting our communities anymore and our families. Is there talk of doing away with life without parole? No, going I mean, I was just going to say that if we, the, the, the legislation before us says that the death penalty will not be applied and instead, uh, life without the possibility of a release will be uh, the, the punishment for that individual. 
There is other legislation yes. uh, that has proposed that those with a life without release would have the opportunity for some mid-sentence review. Mm -hmm. That will be amended to exclude anyone who would have received the death penalty. So I am firmly committed that anyone who would have received the death penalty would be instead sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, and that wouldn't change. Are we, are, how much is bringing back some, some form of parole in the state on the table going forward? Not this year, but going forward. Yeah, we call it post-conviction review. Uh, after a certain period of time, 20 years, 25 years, uh, take a look at those who have shown that they've rehabilitated themselves, met the certain criteria, give them a hearing, possibly release them. Uh, and uh, that's uh, contentious, but we'll, we'll have that debate How as well. How does that sit with you if, the, if anybody who would have, you know, otherwise been on death row, aggravated murder, if that were exempted? Well, we have to look at the whole picture. I mean, I have officers calling me and they're picking up people and before they can finish their report, they're walking out of the jail. And so we have a huge issue. I mean, we talk about the shooting on Pines and Fourth in Seattle and there's 64, 64 charges against the two individuals and they're still walking around. And so, they were no, actually just picked up in Vegas well, the other day. Yeah, Finally. picked up in Vegas. Yeah. So, I mean, you have this, they're walking the streets with 64 um, charges and, and we're, we're not doing our jobs and our job is to protect our community and keep them away. We really have to look for, if you do not have the leverage, and I mean, this re recently occurred, we had a murder, you know, of the uh, corrections officer. Um, and yeah, Jamie Bingham. Yeah. yeah, you do not have that leverage. You may not be able to find, and these are only used in particular instances. You can't you find victims, emergency, jeopardy. Um, when you may have a victim somewhere else, and you pick up the individual, and this has been used in other states, and you have that, you know, as leverage, you can find that victim alive, and that has occurred. So these are huge issues, and and we also have to talk about when we talk about sentencing and reform and and time. We have to talk about the victims too, and Representative Jenny Graham really brings that perspective of the victims and really what they're going through. And so having a victim talk about what should be along that process is a huge part of the criminal justice system. Yeah, the, uh, I was just talking to our uh, local prosecutor here uh, last night about this issue, that victims are sort of given a symbolic role, uh, a little bit of a nod in the criminal justice system, and we want a sentencing system, a system of criminal accountability that's much more victim-centered. Some victims in, uh, who live in communities where there's a lot of community violence uh, want their communities to change. They want to reform the system uh, rather than maybe reflexively punish uh, people. Other victims really want uh, uh, you know, accountability and, and, and retribution. And so we don't really have too, enough of the case-by-case consideration of what victims really want. I want to ask you about one other bill that's before the legislature this year before we wrap up and that is a, uh, essentially a ban on solitary confinement for youth, for juvenile youth. And I want to ask you about this because on understanding that solitary confinement for anybody is damaging, the research shows that, um, but King 5 News recently reported on what's happening at Green Hill School which is understaffed. They've uh, last May actually had a riot during which, and it was caught on video where there was a few staff members, a bunch of the youth there attacking staff members. It was a melee that went on for quite some time. And they were speaking with a counselor there who said it is not a safe work environment. It would seem like in those circumstances they might want the option of solitary confinement. So where does that stand, especially in the context of reality on the ground when you're running these facilities? Yeah. I don't know if that legislation is going to make it through the system, uh, the, the process this year. Um, there are actually other priorities in terms of uh, uh, giving the support to staff at the juvenile facilities and also helping these juveniles who have run afoul of the law uh, get back into the community more successfully. Um, the, one of the issues, we absolutely do have to isolate those who are disrupting the environment. Uh, but and I realize there are ways you can do that if you have the proper facilities that don't involve solitary confinement. Y well, you can put them, uh, uh, you know, you can isolate them alone, but not for lengthy yeah. periods yeah. of time. But you do need adequate staff uh, to manage these facilities, and that's another huge uphill battle for us. Okay. Um, if you, I don't know if you have an opinion particularly on that issue, but just a last word for each of you as you think about sort of where we are in this time. Uh, 2020, as the state grows, we grapple with a lot of these issues around public safety, corrections, law enforcement relations, and recruitment. 
I just think it's so important that we look at the whole picture. I mean, law enforcement, and it's not just law enforcement reactionary, it's being a part of the community and it's protecting the community. When you put on that uniform, you love people and you love people so much, you even love them you know, above your own safety. And that's a, that's a huge calling for people. So to, to make sure we give them all their tools and the resources to do their job and uh, you know, uplift that really important responsibility for protecting us. They call no matter who call, come when no matter who calls, they're there for us. And then also when it's your baby or your family or your spouse, you want them there as fast as possible. So making sure that we protect our law enforcement community and, and really respect them, but also protect our communities as a whole so we don't continue to have these issues and, and heinous crimes that are occurring and make sure we protect our community from the people that we should be protecting them from so that it doesn't continue and you do not have those victims. Okay. So we have, um, uh, in the nation, uh, one of the lowest crime rates. Uh, it's actually a very high quality of life here in this state. I say probably one of the best places on earth to live uh, in this time in human history. Uh, and we want to keep it that way. Uh, and law enforcement are a key part of that. And bringing law enforcement together with the community, and we've made a lot of progress with that, uh, is part of that. And so I think we've really made it uh, down a long road uh, toward progress in this area, preserving our really high quality of life. Certainly a conversation to be continued. Uh, State Representatives Roger Goodman and Jacqueline Maycumber, thank you both for being here.